I'm going to bring you a message tonight on how the Jews were saved and how the Gentiles are saved. Now, there are many people who somehow feel that there is no gospel story in the Old Testament. That is, however, far from the truth. Because the cross with its saving power was made known even to Adam and to his sons. And you could trace it throughout the Old Testament. And I think that the Passover was closely linked to Christ in the New Testament. When he said, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. More than 200 years before this, Israel had gone down into Egypt in the search of corn. And they came under taskmasters and were made slaves. And it became so that their cries came up under the ears of God, and God purposed in his heart to deliver them from the hands of Pharaoh and, and Egyptian bondage. I'm going to deliver them from the land of Egypt. Egypt is a type of death. Everything that's ever come from Egypt has been a type of death. And so Moses became the one that God's going to use, the instrument God's going to use to bring the people out of Egypt. Moses, of course, started to do it in his own strength and killed an, an Egyptian and hid him in the sand and then had to flee for his life and went to the backside of a desert. And there a phenomenon, he looked upon a bush that was blazing. And he turned toward the bush and it burned, but yet was not consumed. And a voice out of the bush said, Take off your shoes, for the ground on which you stand is holy. And then the voice said, I want you to go down into the land of Egypt and stand before Pharaoh and tell him that he must let my people go. And he said, Whom shall I say? And he said, I am has sent me unto you. I am has sent me unto you. I am the I am. That's what Jesus said once, if you believe not that I am he. Someone said that he is not in the original language. He said, if you believe not that I am. If you believe not that I am the I am, then you shall die in your sins. And then he said something about what sign will I have? And he said, what do you have in your hand? And he said, a walking stick. And he said, throw it down. He threw it down. And he became a serpent. He said, take it by the tail. He took it by the tail. And it became a walking stick again. And he said, I want you to take that and go down into the land of Egypt and stand before Pharaoh and tell him that he must let my people go. And then he said, I am slow of speech and of a stammering tongue. God said to him, he said, take your brother Aaron, he... He is an orator. You can take him with you. And he took Aaron, but he never had to use him. He never had to use Aaron. Am I not the God who made your mouth? So he went down with that crooked stick for artillery. He went down and stood before Pharaoh and said, You must let God's people go. And you're familiar with how Pharaoh's heart was hardened time and time again. Then he started to bring the plagues in upon the land, turning the water into blood bringing the murren in among the cattle and bringing the lice in them and among the, and the locusts and so forth. And then he brought the frogs in upon the land. And then after that he came to the last one. And he said, this is the last one now. Each time his heart was hardened and he said, this is the last one. He said, Agree, I'm going to have the firstborn, the firstborn of every home in the land of Egypt tonight shall die. The firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die in the fifth verse of the eleventh chapter. From the firstborn of Pharaoh's palace that sitteth upon the throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and from the firstborn of the beast. He said, the firstborn in every home in the land tonight shall die. I believe with that tonight you're brought face to face with the universality of sin. There wasn't a home that night in the land of Egypt in which there was not one dead. From Pharaoh's palace to the humble peasant, there was not one dead. And with that, I think God brings us to realize this, that all are dead in sins and trespasses against God. All are dead in sins and trespasses against God. You say, Brother Lincoln, what do you mean tonight by this? I mean this. You're going to have to realize tonight, rich or poor, high or low, ignorant or educated, 
there was not a whom that night was free from the judgment. And that's the universality of sin. There isn't a square mile of dirt upon God's earth where the sole of foot of man, sole of the foot of man is trod, my friend, is free of sin and wholly given over to God. The universality of sin. Brilliant man may frame an argument against the inspiration of the Bible, against the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the bodily resurrection, heaven or hell. But no man can argue against one thing, and that's the existence of sin. Sin that's neither natural, normal, nor necessary. Sin that God hated yesterday, hates today, and will hate forever. Sin nothing has ever cut such walls or plowed such harrow, such furrows or wrought such havoc as sin. Sin that's the undertaker at every funeral. Sin that's caused every tear to blister the cheek. Sin that's populated hell and depopulated heaven. Sin, sin, my friend, is the thing that we need to realize tonight the reality of. If I was calling a church, if I was a calling, if I was calling a pastor to a church, I wouldn't ask him how he stood on the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the blood atonement. I'd ask him one question: How do you stand on the doctrine of sin? If he's right on that, he's usually right on all the rest of it. If he's right on sin, call it the mistakes of what you want to. Call it what you please tonight. Call it error. Call it what you will. The fact remains that it's sin. Biting, blistering, mildewing, damning sin with the hiss of the serpent in its sin. You can have all of the psychiatry and you can have all that you want. Did you notice Mrs. Landers today that solves all the problems she couldn't solve her own? Amen. What's she going to do about helping people with divorce now? Let me say this to you. You've got to have more than psychiatry. You've got to have more than that. I don't go much on the psycho anyway, amen? Well, I went to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, What's your trouble? And he said, I have the feeling that I'm a dog. I said, How long have you had the feeling? He said, Ever since I was a puppy. <laughs> now, you don't need that tonight. You need to come to a realization of the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let me give you the second one, and here it is in this verse. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it or shall be like it any more. I've often imagined getting off down in the land of Goshen a little past midnight, and I hear the most blood-girdling screams I've ever heard penetrating the midnight air. And I say to a person, what's the scream? What's the trouble? They said, it's the judgment of God upon the land of Egypt. The firstborn has died. It's the judgment. I believe the anguish and the bitterness that befell the Egyptians is typical of the anguish and the bitterness that will befall those when they shall cry for rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. It's those who cry when the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Don't hear much about the wrath of God anymore, do you? You don't hear much about the wrath of God. You got, you got. I imagine you have churches in this city tonight that hasn't had an old-fashioned, genuine hell, far damnation sermon preached on them about hell in the last twenty years. Amen. Preacher said to me, I went to hold a meeting for him, and he said, I announced that I would preach on hell the next night, and he said, you know, Dr. Lakin, if I, they told me when I came here to be nice and visit the sick and bury the folks and marry the people and. And they'd pay me. He said, if I'd mentioned the word hell, I'd have to stop and explain what I meant. Well, I said, Doctor, I'm going to give them hell for the next week, so you might as well get ready for it. <laughs> I'll tell you, I believe that we need to preach the wrath of God. Amen. The wrath of God, a woman said, I hate the very thoughts of hell. I do too. I hate the thoughts of the jailhouse and the hangman's noose and the electric chair and murder and all that sends people there, but my hatred of it doesn't keep it from being a reality. I used to have a pastor. My wife said when I was there, he was pretty good. But when I happened to be home, he'd wander way out into left field. And one day I was sitting one Sunday morning and he was preaching. And he talked about heaven, how beautiful it was. And then he said, of course, there is the other place. I said, well, ring a ding ling. (laughs) 
I said, do tell. And my wife punched me. And then he said, now I hope that didn't sound like I was scolding you. Because I love you too well for that. I said, somebody ought to kiss him. And she punched me again. A man that doesn't tell you about hell and about judgment and about sin doesn't love you. It's your money he's after. Amen? It's your money he's after. He said, a great cry shall go throughout all the land, such as you've never, you've never been like it or shall be like it anymore. And in that day when the great day of his wrath has come, I saw where the leading evangelist, they asked him the other day if he believed in, in hell, in, that hell fire was literal. And he said it was neither hot nor cold. So I suppose it's a sort of a summer resort where they serve you ice water on a tray. I believe it's exactly what God said in his word. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you this tonight. If there is no hell, Jesus Christ was a liar and a fool. He was a liar when he taught over and over again that there was one. And he was a fool when he climbed up on a cross and died to save men from something that never existed. If there is no hell, then this church is teaching a lie and playing the part of a fool. They're teaching a lie when they're teaching that there is one and playing the part of a fool when they spend multiplied millions of dollars, my friend, to get a gospel out to save people from something that never existed. If there is no hell, then I ought to go home tonight to my wife and down yonder in Florida and fish and sit around and, and enjoy myself. And I could do it if I wanted to. Somebody said, why don't you? Because the love of Christ constraineth me. I'm a fool to stand and preach and preach until I'm driven to a hospital and cannot go any longer. Oh, our brother talked tonight about the soon coming of the Lord, and I believe he is coming soon. Amen? I tell you what I'm doing. I'm planning my work like he's not going to come for 50 years. And then I'm living like he's coming tomorrow. Because some of these mornings I'm going to step out of my house and my foot won't touch the sidewalk. I'll take another step and I'll go up a couple of feet higher. I'll take another step and I'll walk up among the branches of the trees and take another step and I keep stepping and the first thing you know I'm up above the tops of the trees. And then my coat falls off and my hat and my shoes. That'll be a big day for the rag man. And I keep on stepping on up and I get up yonder among the fleecy clouds and thank God I'm gone. Take it up to be with him. That's what I'm saying. Amen. I believe the gates are going to open, amen. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something tonight. I said to a fellow, he said to a fellow, I said to a fellow, he said, I don't believe there's any hell. I said, you wait and see. <laughs> You're like the little girl said, Mama, I'm not going to marry the fellow. He don't believe there's a hell. She said, you marry him. We'll show him. Let me show you. Something. Let me show you. Let me show you something tonight. I said to a fellow, do you, I said to him, do you believe in the heaven? He said, yes. I said, why do you believe in the heaven? He said, because I think my mother went there. I said, why do you think your mother went there? He said, because the Bible says so. I said, the same Bible that said your mother went to heaven says ten times more about hell than does about heaven. Let me tell you something. If you're going to have a heaven, you've got to have the opposite. If you have black, you've got to have white. Amen? You've got to have the opposite. Hell is a necessity. You've got to separate whatever undertaker's office and every garbage can. That's, my friend, an evidence of hell because the dead, the rotten, the king has got to be separated from the good. Amen? Let me tell you something. He said the great, that the great cry shall go up throughout all the land. But listen to this one. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. Against the children of Israel a dog won't bark. You know, he talks about some other places in the Bible about the priest being dumb dogs. That's D.D.'s. Let me show you. (laughs) 
A dumb dog that can't bark. That's what he called them. What good's a dumb dog? He can't warn you of anything that's coming over her. He can't warn you about anything. A dumb dog. Let me tell you something. I don't want to be a dumb dog. I'm going to warn people of what's coming like he did tonight. Amen? Oh, I wish we had that kind of preaching going out over the air and over every radio and television and all up and down this land. I wish we had it. Amen? I wish we had it. Let me tell you something. That you may know. Not, he said that the dog will not bark. Why? That you may know that God puts a difference. That God does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. God puts a difference between... Now, somebody says that God made a difference and that difference was not justified. God did make a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And that difference was justified. you know what? But the difference was not on the basis of the character of the two classes. From the standpoint of greatness, the children of Israel were far in the race, in the lead. They were... From the standpoint of greatness, they, the Egyptians were far in the lead. The Israelites were a vassal race under taskmasters, and they were counted no more than dogs by the Egyptians. But now they're, they're, they have the loss of the, they have the dead, and they're exempt from the judgment, and the others are judged, and what's the difference? God does make a difference, but you know where the difference was. I'll tell you where it is. There was no home that night in the land of Egypt in which there was not one dead. However, in the case of the Egyptians, in the case of the Egyptians, a son died. In the case of the Israelites, a lamb died. But it had to be a son or a lamb. And it was upon the basis of the death of the lamb that God made his difference. And it's upon the basis of the death of the Son of God tonight that God makes his difference. That's where God makes his difference. Now notice this. You come down into the twelfth verse, you'll know why God made his difference. He said, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. What's he said? He said to you, children of Israel, you're going to count, you're, you're going to date your calendar from the day that you come out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt. You're going to date your calendar from the day that you come out of Egypt because I've taken no account of you as long as you were in Egypt. I've taken no account of you. I only take account of you the day you come out of Egypt. And when you come out of Egypt, you'll date your calendar, and they date their calendar now from the day that they came out of Egypt. The day they came out of Egypt. Why? Because... All the time that you were in the land of Egypt, you were outside the will of God. And there I t therefore I take no account of you. Did you know that God, we usually count time of a date of a man from the date of a man's birth. God counts time from the date of his regeneration. Amen? In other words, God takes no account of the person as prior to regeneration. All of the years you spent prior to regeneration are wasted years. Wasted years. They're filled with deeds that can never pass into the nowhere. And they're filled with deeds that can never receive a reward. And so, my friend, when you, are, when you have been born again, you never begin to live until you begin to live again. And then you begin to live the life that counts and the life that never dies and a life that, play, that, play, that play, pays a reward in the world to come, even to the cup of a cold water. That's what you're given when you come. How many people do you have tonight that have, never, that have never lived a day? They've existed for 75 or 80 years. It shall be unto you the beginning of months. Let me give you this one. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Now, he said they shall take to them every man a lamb. Of course, the lamb is typical of the Lord Jesus. If you'll go into the, New Test into the book of the Revelation, you'll find, take your pencil when you read it the next time and underscore the lamb. It was by the blood of the lamb they overcame. It was the bride, the lamb's wife. It was the marriage supper of the lamb. The lamb was the light of the city. It's always the lamb. It was by the blood of the lamb they overcame. And he said it was the song of God and of the lamb. It's always the lamb, the lamb throughout 
all of the book of the Revelation. And in the tenth day of the month they shall take the ever man a lamb according to the house of their fathers. Now there's the individuality of salvation. A lamb for an house. Salvation is absolutely an individual matter. I held meetings in Holland, up in Holland, Michigan, and they have up there what they call covenant salvation. I say to a person, are you saved? Yes. How long have you been saved? I've always been saved. My, my parents were Christians, and I was born a Christian. No, my friend, you're, you're saved individually by trusting Christ. Did you know this, that Christ died for you just as individually as if no one ever lived in this world but you? Someone said the other day that what we need is to get away from the idea of Judson and Carey of that personal application and get back to the more world sweep of the gospel. I say what we need is to come back to the idea of Judson and Carey, of the personal application of the gospel to the heart of the individual. Why? Because there is no such thing of whole countries becoming permeated with the ethical conception of the gospel of Christ and, and thereby being saved. The individuality, a lamb for an house. And he said, if the household be too little for the lamb. Now, the lamb was never too little for the house. Thank God he's adequate to any person. Amen? He's never too little. I do not know of any case that's too big and too hard for him. person said to me, you know what? I heard Dr. Tom Malone preach a great sermon. He's a great preacher. I heard him preach a great sermon on Jesus dealing with hard cases. He said, Jesus specializes in hard cases. Amen? In hard cases. And they carried the man yonder and went up on the roof and tore up the roof and let the man down at the feet of Jesus. Don't you imagine the ladies on the arrangements committee? Whew. They said, did ever you see such, such carryings on? Did ever you see anyone with such sensationalism I, went, I had a young fellow, I had a young boy from Bob Jones University as my associate assistant pastor once. You can always tell a Bob Jones boy. Can't tell him much, but you can tell him. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Bless God, let me say this. I'm a member of the board of Bob Jones University, and I thank God for their militant stand through the years. Amen. For the gospel of Christ. For the gospel of Christ. But Jim was my, was my assistant, and I went away. I came back, and I said to my wife, how'd Jim get along? She said, wonderful, but I felt so sorry for him. I said, why? She said, why there was preaching Sunday night, he put his foot on the edge of the communion table. And when it was over, oh, old sister Broadmouth, she tore into him, and what she said to him was terrible. I said, I'll fix her, you wait. <laughs> and when I got up to preach that night, I said, son, they told me you did a fine job preaching. But you did an unpardonable thing, they tell me. They told me that you put one foot out on the edge of this table here. Don't ever do that. That's unpardonable. If you're going to walk out in the middle of it, I said. <laughs> so I walked out in the middle of it. I thought I might as well just break her one time as another, amen? Specializing in hard cases. Dr. Malone said, a fellow brought a man down the aisle in his church not long ago and said, Pastor, here's a man broke into our home last night. And I heard him down there and I got up and went down. And he said, uh, I tied into him and he was about to get the best of me and my wife joined in and he's about to get the best of both of, both of us. And the kids got into it. He's about to get us all. Finally, we conquered him. Then I said to him, now, mister, let me tell you something. We are Christians, and you broke into our house. Now, I'll tell you what you can do. You can either get down on your knees and get saved, or I'm going to call the police. <laughs> he said, I believe I'll get saved. <laughs> and he said, here he is. Ah, oh, let me tell you tonight. Jesus specialized. He's never too little for the house. Amen. And said to me not long ago, he said, Dr. Lakin, he said, 
I was born with a thirst for booze in me. I said, bless God, you can be born again with it out of you. You can be born again with it out of you. I was born, I never did have but one bad habit that I know of, and that was swearing. Really, I cussed. I drove four mules and hauling logs when I got saved. And I could cuss a mule in more language. I had to almost learn to talk when I got saved. I had lost so much of my vocabulary. The first morning after I got saved, I went out and climbed up on that wheel mule and picked up the lines and spoke to him. He looked over at the other one and he said, I wonder what's happened to him. <laughs> he said, Brother Lincoln, I have a weakness. Well, so was another fellow that was, that was crippled in his feet and ankle bones, and God strengthened him where he was weak. Amen? Where you're weak, God will strengthen you. He'll break the power of canceled sin. He'll set the prisoner free. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something tonight. I wouldn't give you a nickel for that old dry shucks religion. Amen? For the soul the saved can know is saved. I'm going to tell you something tonight. But notice this. She said, if your, house, if your lamb house be too little for the lamb, share your lamb with your neighbor. Well, bless God, the lamb's not too little for the house, but the house is too little for the lamb. In other words, he's big enough for anyone, but he's too big for any of us. So we ought to share him with our neighbor. Amen? That's what these kids have been doing down yonder, down yonder in... In the islands, what? Sharing the lamb, amen? That's what they're doing over in Mexico, sharing the lamb. That's what he's doing on the television a while ago, sharing the lamb. Sharing the lamb. Somebody said to me, Dr. Lincoln, why do you keep preaching day and night, day and night, driving like you are? Why do you do it? Peddling the lamb, brother. Peddling the lamb. Let me tell you something. That's why these buses go and bring these little boys in. Amen. A fellow said to me the other day, the preacher ran a bus right up past my church. I said, why didn't you run one up past his? Picked up one of my Sunday school boys and baptized him. I said, why hadn't you baptized him before? Don't worry about that. Let me tell you something tonight. If your house be too little for your lamb... Then share your lamb with your neighbor. That's the mission spirit of the thing. Share your lamb with your neighbor. I want you to notice another thing. And ne next unto the house, take it according to the number of souls every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. And your lamb shall be without blemish. Ooh, a male of the first year. Couldn't be gap-eared or one-eyed or bob-tailed. Had to be perfect. Why? Because he represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him was no sin. Amen? He was perfect. You're not redeemed with silver or gold, but with the precious blood and suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. I never could have stood before God perfect if I didn't stand in a perfect lamb. That's what I stand in. He not only... But he being perfect, he not only took away my sins, Thank God He put upon me His righteousness. He not only took away my sin, but He put upon me His holiness. And God looking down from heaven tonight doesn't see me. He sees the Lamb, and I'm in the Lamb. And when He sees that, He sees perfection. And I stand before God tonight as pure as the down on an angel's wing. Amen? And He... Hallelujah. And He's... And he's holding my picture up before the Father. I used to say he's holding my yeah, he's holding my name up, but he's not holding up my name. That wouldn't be good. There'd be somebody else of my name. But he said he has my image engraven in the palms of his hand. Thank God he's not holding up my, my name. He's holding my picture up before the Father. And there's no mug ever looked like this one. And so I know that's the reason, thank God. The lady said, Dr. Lake, you think you'll make it? I said, already got it made. Amen. <laughs> He's holding and praying that my faith fail not. 
Isn't that wonderful? Listen, he took away my sin, put upon me his righteousness, and now I stand perfect in him tonight. That's what saved Noah. It wasn't his knowledge of the ark. There are the fellows that built it knew more about it than he did. And it wasn't his works because he didn't have a hole he could put a pad lad out and help pool. He could just sit in there and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet that sound. No matter how high the water rose, how much it rained, he was perfectly secure. Yo, oh, you say, but he was perfect. No, he wasn't. He got drunk as soon as he got to the other side of the flood. You know what saved him? He had a perfect ark. That's what saved him. He had a perfect ark. And as far as God's concerned tonight, I'm already seated in heaven. And I've got an inheritance that's undefiled and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for me, that's kept by the power of God. I believe the one who reserves the inheritance will preserve the heir. Amen. I have a good friend, Harry Payton, old Harry was going to come up to see me, told him to be up to eat supper with me last night. And he didn't. He, he storied to me, and, and he doesn't believe you're saved forever because he better quit that line. Now he'll not make it, amen? Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, he's a good old buddy of mine. And I pay, uh, Harry was in my meeting one night, and I was talking about my inheritance undefiled and fate is not away. I said, it was kept by the power of God. I said, Harry believes in salvation by grace, but he still feels like he's got a fairly good chance to go to hell. And I said, I suppose, I dream sometimes I'm walking down the streets of heaven and I see a big sign, a big mansion yonder, it's got a big sign on it, for rent. <laughs> I, said, I said, what, he got that on for rent? He said, we built it for old Harry and he fell from grace yesterday for <laughs> <laughs> we had to rent it out. <laughs> I said, where's mine? He said, well, we had her built, but a cyclone got her yesterday. <laughs> I believe the Lord that, preserve, that reserves the inheritance will preserve the air. Amen? I said, you saved? You said, I'm in the process of being saved. Well, if you're saved, you're just as safe as I am, whether you believe it or not. Amen? Now, let me show you <laughs> Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you take it out from among the sheep and from the goats. Now they went down and took the lamb out from among the sheep and the goats, separated it. Now when they separated it, the lamb was judicially dead. Amen? Judicially dead the moment they separated it from the flock. And the, you ask when Jesus Christ was given to die? From before the foundation of the world. He stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I heard a quartet singing. I searched through heaven, I searched through heaven, they searched through heaven and found a Savior. Well, they didn't search for nothing. Amen? Jesus knew he had to die before God ever made a man. Jesus knew he had to die before God ever made a man. Even in the creation of, even when he pronounced, even in the creation of Eve, he pictured Calvary. Amen? Caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, opened his side. Adam was the first man that ever experienced a major operation under an anesthetic. And he opened his side and took out a ribbon, a rib, and made Eve. Adam is the first engineer that furnished the spare parts for the first loudspeaker we ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mess, ain't I? Let me tell you something. I get a little truth in as long as it goes, though, don't I? But you know what? You know what? When he pictured that, he pictured Calvary. When he said, Thorns and thistles of the earth bring forth, he pictured the day. When the Son of God with a thorn thinking on his brow would walk into Pilate's hall. When he said, by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread, he pictured that day when great drops of sweat like blood would be falling down to the ground. He pictured Calvary before the foundation of the world. Jesus knew he had to die. And when the fullness of time had come, God never runs ahead of time or behind time. 
When the fullness of time had come, he walked over the embattlements of heaven and down the golden stairways of glory and came into this world by the way of a barn door and went out by the way of an old rugged cross, rode on a borrowed beast, sailed in a borrowed boat, went through a fish's mouth to get money to pay his taxes, died on a borrowed cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, and said, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He knew! He knew! At the baptism of Jesus, he pictured his death, burial, and resurrection by which he would save the people. And in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, The hour has come. If it be possible, let this cup pass. He said he didn't want to die. He didn't want to die there. He said, Let me go on to Calvary. Let me go on to Calvary. Jesus was never taken by surprise about anything. He knew the way out of everything he went into, even the grave. Amen. He said, you crucify me, you kill me, but I won't stay dead. Amen. And they killed him and slipped him into a tomb, rolled a stone to the door of the tomb, and the devil got up a straddle of the tomb and swore that he'd have to remain there. And on the third morning I stand there beside the grave, and a halo plays around his head, and the skin loosens on his forehead, and the eyes begins to open, and then the breath of God swept through that slumbering clay, and up! From the grave he arose. A mighty triumph o'er his foes and lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah, Christ arose. And he walked out yonder and dangled the key to his girdle and said, I am he that was dead and am alive. And am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of hell. And because I live, you too shall live also. A Catholic friend of mine said I couldn't go to heaven without going to the Catholic church. I said, why? He said, St. Peter's got the keys. I said, let old Pete keep them. I've got the door. Thank God. I didn't... Amen. Let me tell you. Oh, I feel good tonight. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I better quit, though. Let me tell you. You want a little more of it? Amen. Okay. And he said, you shall take it and keep it up to the 14th day and kill it. Kill it in the evening. He uh, kill it in the evening. And they crucified him in the evening. When they crucified him, the sun went down. And we've been in the darkness now for 1,900 years. But I think, as he said tonight, we're getting near to the morning. Thank God we're coming near to the morning now. When the light, when the Son of Righteousness shall come with healing in His wings. You say, why do you think we're near the morning? Why? Because the darkest hour of the night is just before dawn. Do you ever see it any darker than it is now? The coldest hour of the night is just before dawn. Do you ever see it any colder spiritually? Oh, you can preach a month and get a holy groan out of some old saint. But did you ever see it as cold spiritually that it is now? Let me tell you something. And he said this. He said, he'll come as a thief. In the night, when does the thief come? He comes in the night time. And I believe we're getting near to the morning. Why? Because people sleep the soundest just before day. And the thief comes when you least expect him. Boy, they're, they're, not look, they're not looking for him tonight, are they? As it was in the days of Noah, only eight souls were looking for the flood. We're looking for him. Very few looking for him to come. Very few looking for him to come. He'll come when you least expect him. This will be a good time. Old fellow, his wife said, honey, there's somebody downstairs. And he got up and went down and there was, turned on the light and there stood a man with a gun. And he said, listen, you can have all the valuables and everything, but before you go, I want my wife to see you. And the thief said, why? He said, because she's had me up every night for 20 years looking for you. And I don't want, I don't want her to miss you now that you've come. Let me tell you something, <laughs> Let me tell you. I'm going to show you something. He said you shall kill it. Now that's where the that's where the moderns turn up their theological snoot and call it a baptism in gore, a slaughterhouse religion. May I remind you that the life of Jesus and the perfection of Jesus was of no avail. No one would have been saved simply because he lived perfect. Neither would his death been of any good account without that perfect life. But that perfect life was no good without his death. But being perfect and being the Son of God, he could die. And that death did atone for the sins of the world. The fellow said to me, 
You mean to tell me that the blood of one man can atone for the sins of the whole world? I said, sir, it was not a business transaction. It was a moral satisfaction. But had it been a business transaction, I believe that the deity of Christ lent a costliness to his blood that would have made it avail to pay for every sin that man ever committed in this world. That's the thing tonight. He shall kill it, and then he shall take the blood, and he shall take the blood and strike it upon the two side posts. And the upper doorpost, because he's looking down now through the blood, that my sin that scarlet, and it becomes as white as the driven snow. And then you shall put it on the two side posts, because as you go through this world, you become contaminated with that which you brush against, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us daily from all sin. And he said, you shall take the lamb and roast it with fire. Now, the lamb wasn't roasted, and you shall eat it. Not for safety, because you're made safe for the blood. But you eat it for invigoration. You eat it to make you strong for the journey. You're saved by the blood. But you're made strong for the journey by feasting upon the roasted lamb. That's what I'm telling And he said, you shall eat it in haste. For it's the Lord's Passover. What does he mean? He said, the minute the blood goes on your doorpost, eat it in haste now. And you shall eat it with your loins skirt about, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. That's the picture of a pilgrim. Amen. Got his loins girded about, got his all up ready to travel, got his shoes on his feet. I wondered why they never wore out. He had on wooden shoes. Every time a rattlesnake come out, stomp his head off. Bulldog charge him, kick his jaw off. Amen. <laughs> When you get saved, get under the blood, you're not to stay there. You're to come out of Egypt. You're a traveler and a wanderer. Amen. Here you have no continuing city. Amen. When you get under the blood, then leave Egypt and come out of Egypt. Amen. And they started toward the promised land. And they started toward the promised land. That's the picture of the pilgrim. And they got along pretty well, made safe now by the blood. And they got down yonder toward the Red Sea. And they looked back and Pharaoh's army was coming, a mountain on each side of them, and the Red Sea out in front. I know the Sunday school literature said they took them over on the, on the, on the reed bed. <laughs> That's a bunch of oil. Let me show you something. And they were just milling about and milling about, and Moses said, stand still. Well, poor God, we've got to help him out. We, God's got to have a little help. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You're not going to see it as long as you're scared to death. Stand still. It's like you go to teach your wife. They'd surrendered, but they hadn't relaxed yet. Amen. You go to teach your wife to drive the car, and you've surrendered, and get over in the other seat, and she'd drive. Look out! You're going to kill us. You haven't surrendered. You surrendered, but you haven't relaxed. Amen. Pharaoh's, uh, there's the Red Sea. Pharaoh stretched out, the, the, Moses stretched out the rod. The water stood up and stood up here. They walked down into it, and those old Hebrews going along, and the fishes coming up, poking their nose out at them, you know. And they got over on the other side and held a praise meeting. They had a regular hole in this camp meeting. And they all got to shouting, but Sister Miriam, she was, she was the sister that thought that it ruined their... Beautiful Sunday morning, morning worship. And so she got to criticizing and got the leprosy. You better watch some of your old critics. You'll get the leprosy if you don't watch. Amen? And they got on out in the wilderness. And you know what they did? They've been saved by blood, delivered by power. Now, there's a lot of folks that's been saved by the blood as they were in type. And you've been baptized by immersion as they were in type, under the cloud and in the sea. And they're over there now in the promise, they're over there and they all get to complain because they missed that Egyptian food. And they were lusted for leeks and garlics and melons and onions. They got out of Egypt, but they didn't, they left, they brought their Egyptian appetite with them. When you Christian, when you get out of Egypt, then you ought to change your appetite, amen? They still like leeks and garlics and melons and onions. You come over in the promised land on Sunday and get a little mess, but you have to go back during the week to get a little dancing 
and a little tavern and a little card playing. You've got to have a little garlic and a little meat and a little onions. Well, you say, what's wrong with onions? None. But Paul said, if I eat meat, if I eat onions and to defend my brother, I'll eat them more. And they're offensive. Amen. The lady said the other day, how do you get onions off your breath? I said, the best thing ever I tried was garlic. Let me show you something. <laughs> and you know what? They got over there and got, they got over there and got to complaining and kicking about Moses. And then if they took this tack. And they said, did he bring us up here? Did he bring us out here? Weren't there any graves in Egypt? Why? They wanted to die then. They wanted to die. So Moses would be sorry. Amen? After he'd give them quail on toast, after he'd let them drink water out of the rock and all that, like my mama when she used to whip me and I'd go out and stand in the chimney corner and wish it would fall on me so she'd be sorry that she whipped me. And that's the way they did to Moses. And they said this, Aren't there no graves in Egypt? Listen, let me give you this last thing. And he said, when I see the blood, not when you see it, not when you understand it, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Did you ever sit at the communion table and lift the bread and the wine? And could you see all that's in it and the depths of it? And you said, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I don't understand. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will understand it. And he'd come to a house that had blood on it, and he'd pass over. Come to one that didn't have any blood on it. Take the firstborn out of that. Come to another that had no blood. Take the firstborn. Come to another that had blood. Pass it over. Let me ask you tonight, do you have the blood? The fellow said the little boy, said, Daddy, did you get the blood? Did you? He said, Oh, yes, I told the servant to go and get the lamb. I'm sure he did. And I'm sure he killed it. He's always obeyed me. He said, But, Daddy, did he put the blood on the door? He said, I'm sure he did. He said, You know, I'm, I'm, I can't walk. I'm an invalid. I'm the oldest. He said, You know, I'm the eldest said, I'd like to see myself whether the blood's on the doorpost or not. Ten o'clock, he said, Daddy, I'm not feeling very good. And he said, don't you worry. You've been going to that revival and hearing that old man Moses. Got you all stirred up. What are you messing around? You ought not have been going to hear that old man Moses preach. Finally, he said, Daddy, I'm about eleven o'clock. He said, I'm ch- choked. He said, would you carry me and let me see? 11.30, and he said, Daddy, I can't breathe. 11.45, 11.50, five. and he said, Daddy, would you take me and let me see if the blood's on the doorpost? It's my, it's me, it's me that's under death. He said, okay, I'll let you see, and he picked him up, carried him to the door, opened the door. There was the blood sitting in a basin, and the hyssop there. And he had just time to dip the hyssop in it, strike it on the upper door post, the two side posts, and just then the whir of the angel's wing as he passed over. The lamb must not only be slain, and the blood must not only be spilled, but the blood must be applied. He said, one man said perhaps, I'll get the lamb killed tomorrow. We've been busy today, Mr. Death Angel. He said, I'm not coming tomorrow. It's today. It's today. We're going to stand and sing a verse of There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath the flood to lose all their guilty stains. Shall we stand, please? Everybody, bow your heads, will you? All over the room. We're not, now, don't go out for a moment. I'll not keep you long. Go out while I'm preaching. I don't mind. But don't go out when I go to do this. When I go to do this, don't go out. I'd rather you wouldn't come as to go out when I go to give an invitation. If you will, please, play it. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's seed. And sinners plunge beneath that flood to lose all their guilty stains. Bow, bow your head and close your eyes. Everybody sing it, choir and all.
darkness. Hold steady. If anybody wants to come, come on. Like these are coming now. Just get up and come quickly. Some people have already started coming. Come on. Just get up and come on quickly. I'm not going to beg you. Lose all of their guilty stains. Sinners plunge beneath that flood. <laughs>